2 Corinthians chapter 8. We just barely dipped our toes into chapter 8 last week, but we will finish the chapter tonight so that Cody can get on into chapter 9 next week. You notice chapter 8, verse 1, begins with the word now. And then if you were to flip over to chapter 10, you will see that chapter 10 begins with the word now. And what that indicates is that Paul is dealing with different subjects. So chapters 8 and 9 are one theme, and the theme, of course, is giving. Uh, and then chapter 10, he begins, uh, starts talking about a different theme. So chapters 8 and 9 have uh, a handful of verses in them that we tend to read frequently uh, when we take up the contribution on Sunday. And one of the key, wor key verses, rather, in chapter 8 is verse 9, where the Apostle Paul says that Christ at one time was rich, but He made Himself poor, so that we, being poor, can become rich. How many times has a Bible class teacher or a preacher made the comment that the reason why we do certain things is because Christ is our example? And when it comes to giving... Christ is our example. So Paul is dealing with uh, the issue of giving here in chapters 8 and 9, and he uh, is referring to a contribution that the Corinthians have been working on for a while, and he challenges them to bring that contribution to a completion. Let's get the text in front of us. We stopped off last week at verse 6, so we're going to pick up with verse 7, and we'll read down through verse 15. But just as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all earnestness and the love we inspired in you, see that you abound in this gracious work also. I am not speaking this as a command, but as proving through the earnestness of others the sincerity of your love also. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich." I give my opinion in this matter, for this is to your advantage, who were the first to begin a year ago not only to do this, but also to desire to do it. But now finish doing it also, so that just as there was the readiness to desire it, so there may be also the completion of it by your ability. For if the readiness is present, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. For this is not for the ease of others and for your affliction, but by way of equality." At this present time, your abundance being a supply for their need, so that their abundance also may become a supply for your need, that there may be equality. As it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little had no lack. So, looking back up at verse 7, in what had the Corinthians abounded? And faith, and what else? Okay, utterance or word. So that is probably referring to their communication and the love of Christ, and their knowledge, and their earnestness, and in love. Well, that sounds like a good congregation, doesn't it? That sounds like a congregation you'd like to be a part of. That sounds like a congregation that is living what they believe, reflecting Christ in their lives. And so then Paul says that you need to see that you abound in this gracious work also. Now what is the gracious work that Paul's referring to? They're giving. I pointed out to you last time, the word grace is used in verse 1. It's used in verse 4, but it's translated in the New American Standard Version as favor. The Greek word is grace. And then it's used in verse 6, gracious work. Verse 7, gracious work. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 9. And verse 16, the word translated thanks is also the word grace. And then verse 19, gracious work. 
So it is an act of grace for God to give to us because we don't deserve it. And oftentimes it is an act of grace for us to give to others who might not deserve it. We don't want to give to people that don't deserve it, do we? We want to give to people who deserve it. But giving is an act of grace, sharing with others who might not deserve it. But they need it. And Paul will emphasize that later on in this paragraph as we have already read. So verse 8, what does giving show? The sincerity of their love. Giving shows the sincerity of our love. That's why it's gracious. NET version uses uh, genuineness. Genuineness of the love? Yeah. Okay, so it's using genuineness instead of sincerity. Yep. Okay. So it's not pretentious, it's not hypocritical. It's not giving, expecting something in return. Jesus talks about that too, doesn't he? Not giving, hoping for something in return. So we show somebody our sincere or genuine love by giving to them in their need, whether they deserve it or not. Now it's easy to give to somebody who's being nice to us, the challenge comes when we need to give to somebody who's not being nice to us. They're the ones that we say they don't deserve it. The people who are being mean to us, the people who have created a sense of enmity between the two of us, they're the ones that we say they don't deserve it because they've been mean to me. Well, that's not grace. Grace is given to somebody who needs it, whether they're my enemy or not. Paul, of course, says that Christ died for us while we were still his enemies in Romans chapter 5. So here's the big example, the supreme example. In what way was Jesus rich? He had everything, didn't he? He was in heaven with God, everything was at his disposal. The cattle on a thousand hills, the psalmist says. And if he didn't have it, which is silly to say when it comes to God, he could create it out of nothing. Yeah, Jesus was rich. He had no need of anything. So how did he become poor? He gave, it up. He gave all that up. This is not talking about Jesus' poverty from a physical perspective. I don't think that's what he's referring to. Uh, Jesus' dad being a carpenter, he was probably about as middle class as anybody. They did give um, the type of sacrifices that poor people tended to give, you know, when he was born, the turtle doves. But this is not talking about Jesus' material poverty. It's talking about him becoming human. Right, Philippians chapter 2. Uh, Jesus was in the form of God, but did not consider equality with God something to grasp and hold on to, but he emptied himself. That doesn't mean he poured out his deity, as some people think. He didn't get rid of his deity. He poured himself out on earth in the form of human so that he could taste death. So that's how Jesus became poor. Now, how do we become rich? Through baptism, which ushers us into what realm? The realm of Christ. And all of the blessings that are available in Jesus Christ. 
Remember in chapter 1, verse 20, the Apostle Paul had said, all of God's promises are yes in Christ. It is in Christ where we are rich. Spiritually speaking. And that's what motivates us to give physically. Because we know that we have all of the spiritual blessings we need in Christ. And in fact, Christ is going to provide the physical needs that we have. Right? So verse 10. How long have the Corinthians planned to give? They've been planning for a year. I told you about the church that uh, we worked with before we went to Romania and how we had a, a missions emphasis week and we had a huge contribution that particular Sunday. We were planning it uh, to a certain degree for a year, you know, when the elders meet together in the fall of the year and make plans for the year. But as far as a congregation, I think it was about six or eight months when we started talking about it and... and uh, Bible classes were taking up collections so that they could give uh, a lot all on one day. And, and uh, that little small congregation raised $15,000, which was seven or eight times more than their weekly contribution. Uh, the Corinthians are doing something like that. They're collecting their, their, their funds. They've been talking about it for a year. They want to help. You remember last week that we read in verse 4 that they were begging Paul with much urging for the grace of fellowship and support of the saints. Probably taking up that collection that we read about from time to time, like in Romans chapter 15, that is for the needy saints from uh, Judea. So they're all excited and they begged Paul to be able to help with that. And so they started... A year early. Now, how hard is it to maintain enthusiasm for a year? <laughs> yeah, which are dead in what, two weeks? <laughs> Maybe the first of February? It depends on what that thing is that you're aiming for. Okay. Yeah. Right. But the energy and the threats from your parents, you know, Santa's watching. Uh huh. That holds true. I mean. So now people like Shayla McGuffey have this little app on their phone that is counting down till Christmas. So you could ask her, you could ask her tonight how many days left until Christmas, and she could tell you. Because otherwise, it's hard to stay motivated. You got to have these things to motivate you. That table right there is a motivation, right? First day of every week, we are reminded why we live for Christ for the next. Okay, got three bars again. All right, so 2 verse 11. By what measurement will God judge our giving? I think that's verse 12. 
By what measurement will God judge our giving? By what we have. Not what we don't have. Boy, if I had such and such money, I would give more. Well, maybe, but that's not the issue. The issue is what do you give now? Is God first in your budget right now? Whether you make 25 a year or 75 a year, where is God in your budget? Does your budget reflect your commitment to God? Does your budget reflect your love for God? God will judge us based on our ability. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, uh, verses 1 and 2, if you have the NIV, I like the way the NIV translates the verse. It's not necessarily literal word for word, which is my preference for Bible translations, but I like the way it, it translates it. The translator says, We are to give in keeping with our income. Now, literally it says, as you've, as you've been prospered. But in keeping with your income is a lot more clear than as you've been prospered. If you have to drive a little pinto because that's all you can afford, then that's how much God expects you to give. But if you drive a Cadillac, I suspect God expects you to give more than somebody who drives a pinto. Here, Paul says that God expects us to give according to what we have, not what we don't have. And, and the best rule of thumb is, just like with the Israelites, when God says, you give me first, you give your crops to me first. You give your best bull to me first. It shows trust. And so when we make up our budget, God ought to be at the top of the list. That's just the best way to know if we're giving the way we ought to be giving. So at the present time, in verse 14, your abundance being a supply for their needs so that their abundance also may become a supply for your need that there may be equality. He's already mentioned equality in verse 13. This is not for the ease of others and, and for your affliction, but by way of equality. Should the church give to make sure all of our members have high-speed Wi-Fi service? No. Is that a need? No. No. You can, exist without, you can exist without a TV. You can exist without internet. If somebody wants internet, if somebody wants TV, they can pay for it out of their own pocket. But can you exist without food? No. Now, there are some areas like that where elders or deacons, if, some, if a deacon is put in charge of that, there are some areas like that where you just have to use judgment. And some, one person might say, let's do it, and another person might say, no, let's not do it. Sometimes the decision is not easy to make. I'll tell you what, one thing we did when we were in Romania was put the benevolence in the hands of the Romanians because it was hard for Americans to know who to help and who not to help because we didn't understand all of the, all of the intricacies of the culture. But once we did that, Church didn't help hardly anybody. <laughs> the Romanians would say, no, they don't need help. And then they'd give two or three reasons why. Well, we just left it in their hands. We're like, you know, there's some benevolence that the missionaries were doing that really we were using our work fund for, but the church contribution was under the control of the, Ro the Romanians so that they could make the own their own decisions. So when I summarize this paragraph, it's graceful to participate with others in service and in evangelism. We need to bring our giving to a completion by giving ourselves first to the Lord. That's what Paul said the Corinthians had done. Remember, verse uh, 5, they gave themselves first to the Lord as well as to Paul and Titus and Timothy. Uh, and we need to give according to what we have. So as we get into the last half of the chapter, anybody have any thoughts or comments on those first 
15 verses. Sometimes we don't talk about giving enough because we don't want to sound like those yellow pages churches. Yeah. Because they talk about giving all the time. Right. But there's a lot of verses in the Bible about giving. Uh, they, I mean, it is a subject that needs to be talked about. You can give more than and you can give more than money. And, and we need to give in more than just one way, right? Somebody doesn't need to say, well, just because I write a check for $1,000 every Sunday, I don't have to do anything else in the church. Well, I don't know if that's exactly right either. Because if we've got talents or skills that the church could make use of, then we need to be using them for God. And probably if we made a list of all the different things the Bible talks about, thematically speaking, giving is probably going to be pretty close to the top of the list. In fact, what was the first act of worship recorded in the Scriptures? Amen. Giving. Cain and Abel. Giving. So yeah, we, we need to be reminded. And maybe that's the reason why God had, uh, had us give the uh, first, first day of every week. That's even more explicit than taking the Lord's Supper first day of every week. I think that's a, there's a strong argument for taking the Lord's Supper every Sunday, but giving every Sunday is even more clear. That's 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. So that's a reminder right there when we give that it's pretty serious. God takes it pretty seriously. Mary Lou? Right. And then they bring, they could bring your doorbell inside from the street. Uh huh. So she said every Sunday after they ate their dinner, then their doorbell would start ringing. And she said, now these people did not have any way to cook food, so you just took them out a plate of food to give them. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, uh, so that, that was really a, a needy country or within the city. Yeah, same thing in Romania. Yeah, if I could take every teenager to Romania just for two weeks, just see what it's like over here, and you'll appreciate what you have. You'll appreciate the freedoms you have. We could go on and on about that. When we first moved to Romania, we stayed in an apartment block, and, and beggars would come to the door, and we would share... We didn't give them money. We would share uh, apples, oranges, loaves of bread, things like that at the door. Well, then our neighbors started fussing at us because the beggars would knock on their door. And so when we bought our own apartment and we moved, we stopped helping people at the door. We would help them because a lot of times they would sit by the grocery stores, uh, outside the grocery stores and beg. And so then we would go in and buy a bottle of water or... Uh, stick a salami or loaf of bread or something like that and then give it to them on our way out. That way we weren't making our neighbors mad at us. Any other thoughts? All right, let's read a few verses here and get the text in front of us. Paul is still talking about this giving, but now he's going to talk about the role of Titus and a brother whom he does not name, uh, and their role in taking up this collection that the Corinthians have been working on for a year. So beginning at verse 16, Thanks be to God who puts the same earnestness on your behalf in the heart of Titus. For he not only accepted our appeal, but being himself very earnest, he has gone to you of his own accord. We have sent along with him the brother whose fame and the things of the gospel has spread through all the churches. And not only this, but he has also been appointed by the churches to travel with us in this gracious work, which is being administered by us for the glory of the Lord himself and to show our readiness, take, <coughs> taking precautions so that no one will discredit us in our administration of this generous gift. For we have regard for what is honorable, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. We have sent with him our brother, whom we have often tested and found diligent in many things, but now even more diligent because of his great confidence in you. 
As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker among you. As for our brethren, they are messengers of the churches, a glory to Christ. Therefore, openly before the churches, show them the proof of your love and of our reason for boasting about you. So, how did Titus feel about the Corinthians' interest in giving for their fellow Christians? How did Titus feel about it? He was excited. The word is earnest in verse 16. If you're a faithful Christian, you're just glad to see people give. It tickles your heart. You're glad to see people helped. You're glad to see uh, Christians coming together to support a common cause. A vacation Bible school Saturday involves a lot of people working a lot of work going on behind the scenes, a lot of work that's been going on for several months. Something like that takes a lot of people. So Titus is one of them, and Titus was excited to see what was going on with Corinth. So, so describe Titus's interest in visiting Corinth. He wasn't compelled to do it, was he? It was his own love and his own interest. Here's some needy Christians here in Judea, and here's the church at Corinth over here in, in uh, Achaia. And so Titus is wanting to bring them together, and he's excited about it. And he says, I'll go do it. I'll go take care of it. Maybe he did travel at his own expense. Um, a lot of Paul's work he did at his own expense. Uh, the church in Philippi helped him, Philippians chapter 4, but Paul obviously was a tent maker and supported himself in a lot of his work. Bob? Uh, I've noticed uh, uh, in the past, and they're still doing it, that there's some that is a lot of prep work done so that uh, food can be given away. Yes. That, that's the work that people don't know about. Yes, yes, that, that's a good example. The food pantry, there's a lot of work that goes on before we get here on Saturday to hand it out. Delbert and Donna and, and Betty and, uh, let's see, Nancy, Jessica and Gary and Mary Kiefer. Am I miss, missing anybody else that really helps out a lot in getting stuff ready? And then we've got a dozen that help that Saturday to pass it out. Yeah, it takes a lot of work. It sure does. And they're glad to do it because they're seeing people uh, be helped. Who wants Titus? Who went with Titus to Corinth? <laughs> Some dude. <laughs> Some fellow Christian. We don't know who it is. Now why Paul didn't want to, or didn't mention his name, we don't know. That's verse 18. We have sent along with him the brother, notice whose fame and the things of the gospel is spread through all the churches. Who is a preacher in Michigan that you would trust to carry your contribution if we did not have the, a way to digitally send it if we had to be sent by hands who is a preacher in Michigan that you would trust to carry it somewhere why does it have to be a preacher who is a Christian I use, <laughs> I use preacher because they tend to be known by more churches who is someone who's a, who's a preacher a Christian that you would trust Somebody that's known by the churches around the area, right? Somebody that's like Brad McFall or, uh, of course, Jerry Tallman's passed away, but a lot of churches know Jerry. So there's, there's preachers that we would trust. Maybe some other Christians don't want to just limit it to preachers. That a lot of churches know and a lot of churches have respect for, and you would trust them to carry the contribution. So that's this individual here that traveled with Titus, and not only that, but notice in verse 19, he has also been appointed by the churches to travel with us in this gracious work. So this was an individual that the churches trust. Now when Joshua Dyke start raising, starts raising funds for his mission work, I'll give him the list of the dozen churches that helped Rachel and me in our work, and I'll write a letter for him to send with his fundraising appeal 
so based on my character reference, then I will be asking them to shift their support from me and Rachel to Josh. And maybe they will. Maybe they'll start helping him. But at the end of this verse, verse 19, what's the result of giving for the benefit of others? To show our readiness. To show our readiness. And I'm looking for the phrase right before that phrase. If it glorifies the Lord. Our giving glorifies the Lord. So we're not just giving to the church when we give on Sunday. We're glorifying the Lord. Because, well, there's several reasons. But when we show by putting God first in our budget, and we show that we trust God, then we are honoring God, we are glorifying God by showing that He deserves to be trusted. And that's why we give to Him first. That's honoring God by showing that we trust Him. And of course, when we give to help others, we're glorifying God by saying, this individual over here who's made in your image has a need, and I'm going to give in order to help them. It might be material need, food pantry. It might be a spiritual need. They need the gospel preached to them. Chapter 10, verse 31 of 1 Corinthians, Paul had said that all things should be done for the glory of God. Taking precautions so that no one will discredit us in our administration of this generous gift, verse 20. So what was the precaution Paul took so they would not be discredited in handling this contribution? Taking someone that they trusted. Taking someone they trusted. Yeah. Paul was concerned about handling the Lord's money, the church's money, which is now the Lord's money, with the highest degree of integrity possible. And I think that's that's required of us. Mary. Try to be a good steward. Yes. Right. Yes, good point. Handle it with integrity and be a good steward of it. I think that's, I think that's a good example for churches to follow. Also. Yes. Swartz Creek has a minimum of two men counting the contribution every Sunday, sometimes as many as four. And checks have to be signed by two individuals in order for it to be legitimate. That's a way for Swartz Creek to keep everything above board. You got me and you trust taking counting the contribution. Three or four, not only not only does that keep everybody honest, but it also helps uh, helps stop errors, you know, accounting errors and that kind of thing. But that's uh, one thing, two things maybe the church here does to try to make sure everything is above board. Keeping a budget, elders give the the treasurer, I mean, the, the deacons give the treasurer the numbers. Here's the numbers I've spent. Here's the checks I've spent. Take it out of the budget. The elders can look at it and say, okay, here's where the money went. Uh, we know who to go to if we have to, to ask, answer a question about how the money was spent. That's all trying to keep everything above board. Bob? We make a mistake, though, the bank charges for that. <laughs> and we want to avoid stupid tax, right? <laughs> Don't make any mistakes. Yeah, the bank will catch you. Stay away from that. Yeah, that's what Dave Ramsey calls a stupid tax. 
letting bills catch up with you or whatever. Okay, so let's handle this in, in the, the, the highest degree of respect and integrity. For we have regard for what is honorable, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. So how, was Paul cons how does Paul consider taking precautions with the contribution? Right. Uh, which you know, is the first part. And I, I really do think that's the key to it. Uh, we want to be honored. We want to be uh, no dispersions uh, uh, set against us. Or no, no, you, can, you can talk bad about us, but we can show you the books. And, and because we got to be right in front of God, we got to be right in front of men. Right. And, and I think that's good not only in the contribution to a lot of other aspects of our life. Yes. As if God is looking over our shoulder all the time. That's just being a person of integrity. Now, it's, a, it's very easy for a missionary to cook the books, to be dishonest with the funds, because there's nobody there looking over their shoulder. Part of the reason why we're having Joshua Dice stay here and work with the Swartz Creek congregation for three years, so we can get to know him, so we can see him, so we can become confident because I've been there. I know how easy it is to be dishonest with the books. We want to see how he handles himself, how he conducts himself. And I've told you last week, I'm strongly urging him to, to uh, uh, give a financial report once a month, once he gets to, to Romania, and be able to explain where he spends every dollar. Not his personal money, but the money that's designed for the work. Whatever dollar we give in the contribution plate, we ought to be able to trace that to the point where he gives it to the man for the rent of the church building or to somebody to pay for um, evangelism work or whatever. He ought to be able to explain to us where every single dollar goes. And I think that comes out of this passage right here as well as a lot of others. It's the Lord's money. We need to be honest with it. And that's even in cases where Yep. Now you said we need to do that in other areas of life. At the end of every month, I give the elders a report of all of the visits and calls that I have made as a preacher. So that if anybody ever comes to the elders and says, well, I haven't seen Paul doing anything for a while. I want to know what he's doing. Well, you go talk to one of the elders and they can print out my monthly report and, and they can say, here's what Paul did on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. Trying to be honest with God's time. I'm working for you. You pay my salary. So to that extent, I'm explaining to you through the elders what I do with my time. <laughs> that just started in March when I turned 50. We, we have sent with them our brother, verse 22, whom we have often tested and found diligent in many things, but now even more diligent because of his great confidence in you. What's the nature of this individual who helped Titus with the contribution? He's proven himself in the past. He's proven himself, just like I've said we're trying to do with Josh. Let him prove himself. Notice he says that he was found diligent in many things. Even more diligent because of his confidence in you. So whoever this individual was, and some suggest it might be Timothy. I would think if it was Timothy, Paul would have told us, but I guess you could say that about anybody. But uh, whoever this was, he had confidence in the Corinthians. Just like Paul did, and just like he had shared with Titus. If you remember back earlier at the very end of chapter 7. Paul says, I boasted Titus about you, the Corinthians. I was not put to shame. We spoke all things to you in truth, so also our boasting before Titus proved to be the truth. Well, apparently that's the kind of, same kind of attitude that this uh, individual had relative to the Corinthian Christians also. Now, verse 23 described Titus.
Titus was, is doing the same thing Paul's been doing. What are the words Paul uses to describe Titus? Number one, he is my partner, my partner, fellow worker. Well, Paul was not a lone ranger. The church, of course, can't be built on one individual because a church's strength is going to be as strong as that individual's weaknesses. So Paul never... There were times where he was by himself, like Acts chapter 17 in Athens, but that wasn't Paul's preference. Paul's preference was to work with other people. And Paul never elevated himself above somebody else. Uh, I have a woman who is looking over my Romanian commentary, and we're working through uh, the Gospel of Matthew, and she was insisting that I capitalize baptizer for John, John the Baptist. Uh, and I'm insisting on not capitalizing it. I know that it's pretty common to capitalize it. But uh, I said, John would not want to be singled out as being special. John's the one who said, I must decrease, but he must increase. Now, the Apostle Paul was the same way. They didn't want to be put on a pedestal. He said, Titus was my partner. He's my fellow worker. We're all equal. Of course, that's a major theme of 1 Corinthians, where the Corinthians were arguing over which preacher was the best. It's Apollos, it's Peter, it's Paul. And Paul says, we're all servants. We're all servants. It is. Preacher Itis comes pretty easily for us, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we just tend to have our favorites in everything. Several years ago, when Jewel was still at home, she would say, such and such is my favorite movie. And then she'd say about a different movie, well, that's my favorite movie. And then she'd say about a different movie, she said, that's my favorite movie. And I said, Jewel, I don't think you know what the word favorite means. So then she had to explain to me how she meant that. <laughs> It's a, it's a category of favorite movies. So, Titus was his partner, his fellow worker, and what else? Messenger of the churches. Messenger of the churches. A glory to Christ. It is an honor to be a servant of the church. If you came to pull weeds out of the rock bed, that is an honor to be a servant of the church. If you've been a Bible class teacher, if you've prepared communion on Sundays, whatever it is you've done for the church, that is an honor. Paul here says it is a glory to Christ to serve the church. In this specific context, he's describing Titus. But of course, the principle goes across the board. How should the church at Corinth respond to Titus and his traveling partner? Hopefully accept them and their love. Yep. So embrace them when they come to collect the contribution. Embrace them. They're men you trust. They're men who love you. They're doing this for the glory of the Lord. So openly before the churches. So he's talking about the churches in Achaia. That's the southern area of, of Greece. As well as the churches in Macedonia. That's the northern areas of Greece. So he says, Before all the churches, let it be known. Show them the proof of your love. If Corinth... Corinth, of course, was a, a large city. It was a metropolitan city. It was a cosmopolitan city. So my guess is... Um, there were a lot of churches that looked to Corinth maybe for um, encouragement, probably smaller churches around. I can imagine that. I don't know if that's true, but I can imagine that. Uh, smaller churches that looked to Corinth for support, for encouragement. Um, maybe they sent out preachers on Sundays to fill in when their local preacher was gone to Thessalonica on vacation or whatever. So Paul says, let these churches know that you openly support these men and show them the proof of your love and of the reason that we boasted about you. 
and treat them the way you treat me. When I write a letter of recommendation for Joshua Dykes to those dozen churches that supported us, that's what I would like to say. I haven't composed the letter yet. Maybe I'll do it. But uh, what I'd like to say is treat him the way you treated me. The first congregation we visited after we came back the first time from Romania, there were members of the congregation that were slipping me cash left and right. The church itself wrote a check just, just because. And when everything was said and done, I walked away from that congregation with $1,000. Most of it was just individual members slipping me money. It was Christians showing their support for a missionary. Somebody who's trying to share the gospel in a foreign country. So chapter 9 continues this discussion about giving. Anybody have any thoughts or comments about uh, chapter 8? Michelle? Uh huh. Too often, as when they name people, people then start to look at that particular person's attributes and whatnot. Am I not like that person, or am I not like that person? Whereas, not naming this person could be any one of us. It doesn't have to be somebody who's just in this particular realm or in this realm or doing this thing or doing that thing. It could be any one of us. Mm hmm. Could be. Well, the, and in Corinthians, as we've been talking about before, I've already had a, had a uh, predilection to, to show preferences towards certain people. So. Yeah. So maybe he was trying to keep down that preacheritis because he was apparently well known by the churches in that area, whereas Titus was from outside the area. Uh, Titus was, well, I don't know where Titus was from. But anyway, not from that area. And this brother was. So our contribution is given to the glory of the Lord Himself. Let us treat it with the highest degree of respect and integrity. Anybody else have any thoughts or comments? Very good. Cody will be teaching next week from chapter 9.